Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Heath, Senior Editor at Politico, and welcome back to the virtual Copenhagen Democracy Summit. We've now got a new panel for you. It's a large panel, uh, so I'm going to run through the introductions now. We are talking about United in Democracy We Stand. So this is democracy promotion and the state of democracy around the world. Uh, things could get a little unwieldy. I think we've got six of us on here. Um, so I want to warn you that we might have to take comments in turn. Uh, and then I certainly encourage the panelists to respond to each other as well as to my questions so that we have as dynamic a conversation as possible. So let me do a quick round of introductions and we'll get right into it. Uh, first, I want to introduce to you Nicole Bibin Sadaka. She's a fellow uh, dealing with human freedom at the George W. Bush Institute. Hello, Nicole. Hello, thank you for having me. <laughs> Next up, Kevin Casas Zamora. He's Secretary General of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, or IDEA, as some of us know it. Hi, Kevin. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, next is Derek Mitchell. He's President of the National Democratic Institute. Hello, Derek. Well, Brian, thank you. Uh, then fourth in the list, we have Jerzy Pomanowski. He's Executive Director of the European Endowment for Democracy. Hi, Jesse. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, we've got Daniel Twining, who's president of the International Republican Institute. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having us. <laughs> okay, we've got a lot to get through, um, but we've also got an hour to do it, so it's going to be a great conversation. Um, first, I think maybe uh, it makes sense if I ask each of you to go through a, a two-minute introduction on what are the key things we can be doing to defend democracy in this time of political disruption, and often crisis. Uh, Nicole, could you kick us off? Absolutely, and thanks for starting. That's the most crucial question we should be grappling with right now. We're seeing a tremendous number of um, serious challenges in the world, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's the concerns about the lack of justice in any number of countries, whether it is disinformation campaigns and undermining of uh, democratic governments around the world. Um, what we can be doing right now uh, has many different levels. So on a global level, we absolutely should be looking at how democracies around the world are working more intensively and closely with each other to hold a very strong line against authoritarianism, whether that is challenging when we see authoritarianism at home, as we do in China, where we see the internment of Uyghurs, or whether that is um, when we see Russia engaging in um, undermining democratic elections. Internally, each of us should be thinking from a governmental standpoint, as well as an advocacy standpoint, how we can be shoring up the institutions in our government to ensure that our governments are, the democratic institutions are functioning as well as they can be. That means that there are checks and balances, that the rule of law is held to, that justice is something that is uh, shared for all people in a society. And of course, it's not just a governmental action. It's something that citizens, journalists, activists need to be actively engaged in because they are an essential part of our governments. unmute myself. That's a big <laughs> faux pas when it comes to being a moderator, I guess. Uh, Kevin, maybe you can pick up the baton. Uh, uh, sure. Is one of those institutions that we really need to be defending the voting process, um, and what else can we be defending? It, the whole package. I think that the first thing that we need to do is exactly what we're doing here, is uh, drawing attention to the, to the plight of democracy in the midst of this emergency. I mean, and, and making sure that people and governments understand that just as this crisis is already having dramatic economic and social consequences, it's likely to have very profound political consequences. And, and it, it, I think that there's, I mean, I'm pretty sure that we're gonna uh, run through the whole gamut of, of risks and dangers for democracy stemming uh, out of the current emergency. Uh, one big, risk that we are facing uh, uh, at this at this time is is connected to the to the use and abuse of emergency powers and uh, it, the, the, the fact that those emergency powers with are a legitimate part of the arsenal of democratic systems to deal with emergencies such as this one can be uh, it can be abused and can become the norm in democratic systems. And, and here I would introduce a, a, a slight nuance. It, for me, the most important danger is that they can become the norm 
not simply because authoritarian leaders demand those powers, but because of fearful citizenry tolerated. And that's where the real danger is, I think. So that's it, you know, a, a big danger looming in the horizon. And then there's a second danger, which is kind of a, is, doesn't come from action, but from a mission, which is the danger that we don't learn the right lessons from this crisis. I mean, this crisis is a showcasing in, in, in dramatic ways. The, the very profound fault lines that are wreaking havoc with our societies. I mean, social fault lines, political fault lines, economic fault lines. Uh, so the danger is that we just uh, go back to normal, that we just go back to normal without any kind of, without giving thought to renegotiating the social contract uh, and without giving thought to a long overdue rebalancing between states, markets, and societies. I think it is becoming dramatically clear the steep price that societies pay when they underprovide public goods in a systematic way for a long time, particularly healthcare. So there's a very big danger in in the in the possibility of simply going back to uh, a, a kind of normalcy uh, that is is not that anymore. So we really have to draw the, the 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 right lessons from this crisis and try to act upon them. Uh, Derek, maybe can you pick up on Kevin's point about inequalities? I, that for sure has struck me. It was right in front of our noses the entire time, and now it is simply unavoidable. And I'd, I'd love to know how much that's influencing NDI's work going forward. Well, absolutely. And thank you again, Ryan. I, I, I completely agree with Kevin when he talks about the dangers, dangers of, uh, uh, of inequality, as you say, but you know, the, the biggest danger to democracy, or one of them is fear and insecurity. When people are fearful and they're insecure, if they're insecure because of their economic situation, their health situation, then they uh, allow for extraordinary measures and, and uh, demagogues to say, you must do these things, otherwise we will be hurt. And um, those are the biggest dangers now, I think, as, as Kevin outlined, but there are opportunities as well. And those opportunities are the fact that um, democracies, the strongest democracies are doing pretty well right now. Um, you, it's a test of governance, this moment, test of how strong civil society is, test how strong the democratic uh, principles of transparency and accountability are um, a civic trust in a society. Um, so now you're seeing a lot of democracies doing well, uh, places like South Korea or Taiwan, you know, the litany Denmark is one that's on that list. Um, and I think what we need to do two things. One is we have to get that word out. We have to win the information war on this because the autocrats are trying to make the case that democracies can't handle this kind of thing that you need to have strong, you know, authoritarian leadership that's placed to their advantages, their, their strengths, which is that strong central control. But you have to demonstrate actually that's not the way to get this done, uh, that the democracies are doing well and make sure that message is getting out there. But as well, what we're doing at NDI is we see the opportunities of working with civil society, working with others to keep the fires burning, to go online. Um, more and more things are in the digital domain counter disinformation, try to link up civil society, use things like ele election methodology to get health information out, um, and to deal with inequities within society, which is absolutely critical. I mean, I think the, um, those inequities around the world um, lead to uh, you know, a sense that this is corrupt, this is only working for some people, this is regardless of, of COVID. Uh, this is before COVID and will remain after COVID. But when there are inequities in the sense that the government is not working for everybody equally, working only for an oligarchy or a certain percentage of the society, people get frustrated. Um, and you'll see that in the left, far left and the far right in countries around the world. Um, and I think now is a time we can level set some of that information and expose some of the, um, I think, the corruption that lies at the center of a lot of these, these governments. Thanks so much. Uh, Jersey. 
we saw from the Alliance's Democracy Perceptions Index that up to 40% of people who live in democracies don't feel that they actually live in a democracy. And some of the lowest figures came from countries within the EU. Uh, how does that change the way you do your job in the EU's uh, backyard? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, a very complex issue. And I think uh, we are working very closely with the people on the ground because we are basically grant making institution. So we are receiving a lot of signals from our activists and people we support. And when you ask a question, what's going on also within EU, the answer is very simple. And that is the answer that is not only related to COVID, but it's related to overall democracy support. Wherever I speak to the European Parliament or to the European Union member states, I always try to repeat whatever we do for them, we do for ourselves. If we believe those values and we want to exercise them here within the EU, we, we have credibility to, to, to promote those values elsewhere. If we lose uh, that credibility, the democracy support concept will disappear, will just cease to exist. So from this perspective, I'm very uh, much engaged in, in collecting now as many voices from the ground, how people on the ground first, they fight with their own reality. Those people, those democracy activists in the countries where democ democ democratic transition is either present or partially only uh, achieved or in the authoritarian regimes. And, and my intention is also, uh, apart from just helping them to transmit their message uh, toward uh, democratic community toward donor community. And I think uh, uh, through, through those, uh, those uh, listening uh, um, activities, we, we already identify uh, several uh, very important threats uh, to democracy that we, I would like to, to quickly share with you. We can talk uh, in details later, but just to, to highlight. Uh, the first we observe in, in many countries excessive use of violence by security forces. So those very violent, uh, uh, approaches are, are present. And as we could see, it, they are also happening in the in democratic uh, uh, countries, not only in the countries in transition. Second, uh, second we, we are seeing elections that are interrupted or, or manipulated. And again, this is element uh, that accompanies uh, the fears and, uh, and the threat of pandemic. And then we see opportunistic clampdowns on political opponents, whether Algeria, Iraq, Lebanon, Kazakhstan, Turkey, these are just few countries I would mention where we could see this as an extremely, extremely visible element. Then we see the censorship and threats to independent media, extremely important element and important threat. Then finally, we, we see the increasing uh, disinformation and this infodemic, it's already a uh, well used uh, term, but uh, something uh, we, we have to be aware that this is on one hand a threat, on the other hand an opportunity, because at the same time, many of our partners on the ground from independent media, they are saying much more new users of independent media emerge during pandemic. So every crisis is an opportunity. And here we also see an, an important opening for all of us, for democracy support organizations, for democratic governments to use this opportunity. So we should find the ways uh, to do it. But if we talk about this information, I think one of the results for me personally in this uh, uh, pandemic uh, is final recognition of China as supplier of this information, which was not that present in different uh, gatherings and, and meetings uh, so far. Russia was only pointed. Now, this company of, of leaders in this information, Russia, Iran, uh, um, China, is well recognized who they are and what they do. And this is something we have to also think about how we, how we um, tackle uh, this uh, global uh, challenge. So uh, I will not mention issues that are of extreme importance like uh, minority groups and vulnerable groups, uh, harassment and using, or also dividing polarizing society, using them as a kind of victims of, of the crisis of the security uh, situation. Uh, that is uh, obvious. Same uh, obvious uh, subject that we often discuss is, and we receive as a signals, is use of digital uh, technology to uh, to do illegal surveillance on, of, on people, mm -hmm. on citizens. This is also a very important issue. But 
I understand we will talk more about specific uh, elements of, of what we um, what we do. We'll what I wanted to that. yes, what I wanted to do is just to list those key threats. That as I said, it, we are not a think tank. We are collecting those feedbacks from the people on the ground who are living in those realities, and they are bringing those stories uh, to us. But we we are trying to make out of it also a certain general reflection. And we are working now together with the several organizations on policy paper, policy advice toward government, democratic governments, international organizations, how and the best way we address those threats. And at the same time, how uh, we use this opportunity to build a kind of new uh, uh, community of people who believe in democracy and who will be ready to fight uh, for democracy. This policy paper will be published in a few weeks. Great, thank you, Jersey. Um, maybe I can pick up a couple of those points and moving over to Dan, that point about leading by example and uh, treatment of minorities. We saw some extraordinary scenes at the UN Human Rights Council yesterday, which is a body that's come under severe criticism since it was set up. Essentially, American uh, uh, critics and foes piling on around uh, the, the treatment of African Americans at the hands of police or more generally, and some of the biggest human rights violators in the world sort of having a door to walk through there. Dan, how much do situations like that complicate the, the work that you are trying to do in defending democracy when everything can be constructed as a gray zone in, in the public debate? Thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm, I'm glad you raised the issue. because We should certainly talk about what's happening in the United States very directly as part of this. Uh, look, the UN Human Rights Council is populated, as you suggested, by many of the world's greatest human rights abusers. So we understand exactly what's going on there. Uh, the UN Human Rights Council has not held uh, extensive hearings or investigations into re-education camps in Xinjiang. Uh, it has not acted on gross human rights abuses in so many countries around the world. Um, the good news about uh, democracy is that it is self-correcting and creates uh, the best channels for people uh, to influence uh, how their government works and how government does protect their rights and uh, what more governments can do to do that. So in America, you know, I'm, I think a lot of us are actually very proud of what we've seen here uh, in the last few weeks in terms of very peaceful forms of people power uh, that we've seen in all 50 states. Uh, you know, this is not strictly uh, something new or strictly something American. In fact, 2019 and 2020, uh, certainly at least before COVID, were uh, the most significant period for people power in the world since the fall of the Berlin Wall. There were more uh, uh, street actions uh, that we saw all over the world in this period over the last 18 months or so than we have seen really at any time uh, since the collapse of the Soviet empire, all over the world. Uh, what you're seeing in America is another example of people power. It's another example of how our citizens, frankly, for 240 years, uh, have used peaceful forms of protest and dissent uh, to secure their equal rights and try to make our country better. Uh, I think the reason we're all in the democracy business and the reason democracy is the best model uh, and example uh, of government is that it creates these channels for citizens uh, to help improve their country, channels that don't exist in China or Russia or Syria or Venezuela or so many other countries. And so in a democracy, uh, luckily, we have institutions, we have free media, uh, we have oversight and checks and balances, and a democracy amplifies citizen voices. Uh, in ways that, frankly, they are simply suppressed and repressed and persecuted uh, in so many autocracies. So democracy uh, contains uh, the uh, seeds of its own renewal and continuous self-improvement. Uh, there is no perfect democracy in the world, not the United States, uh, not any country. Uh, and actually, it requires active citizen engagement to make sure to hold governments accountable. Uh, for securing equal rights and equal justice for all citizens. And, you know, I think we're proud of that as Americans. I think we're proud as Europeans, uh, uh, as others uh, in this group, in this gathering, that our people care about justice and dignity and freedom in the world because we care about those issues in our own countries. It would be perverse if we didn't care about them in our own countries. But that is why we are so motivated by this cause of democracy in the world. Uh, and uh, and the uh, really the imperative, as many of you have pointed out, of uh, protecting democracy from the autocratic challenge that we see out there from China, from Russia, from other very malign actors uh, that want to exploit this for reasons that have nothing to do with our citizens' rights or theirs. Mm -hmm. Thanks, that's a really important point. 
maybe if I come back to you, Nicole, um, I think back to my own time uh, growing up as a, a student, um, and well, it was also my early career, I'm not that young, uh, in the George W. Bush administration, uh, where I, I think sort of defending and promoting democracy came to define a lot of his international reputation, but certainly nobody accused George W. Bush of being an authoritarian. And that is something that uh, some critics do say about the current president. So I just want to know um, how the Trump playbook intersects with the work that you do and whether it you know, makes it more difficult um, or is, is, is something that helps you renew your efforts to, to challenge authoritarianism wherever you find it. Absolutely. Um, I want to pick up on some of the points which Dan made, which is really to pick out this point that there is no perfect democracy. And I think what we see, and we saw this under President Bush, um, is that he was able to both deal with some of the issues at home, but also talk about, about promoting democracy and standing with democratic um, activists around the world. And basically it was to the, to, you know, to the points that were made previously, it was not an either or, right? And I think what we have seen is this, is this um, effort, particularly by the case of authoritarian governments to make it say, we either talk about the United States or us, but what we really have to do is shift this conversation to say, look, these are universal values. These are the values that we share at the United States, as well as many countries around the world. And we can both work on what's going on at home, as well as what's, uh, what's going on in other countries. I think the, the fact that President Trump has chosen to um, step away significantly from democratic values, from, uh, from the, oper the uh, operations of our democratic institutions with integrity has certainly been a step backwards in American democracy. The fact that he doesn't speak openly about democracy at home and democracy abroad, it's a significant step which, which uh, hurts the United States government's credibility abroad. But as has as been pointed out, what we're seeing from American citizens who are going into the streets to talk about injustice, to talk about ensuring that our democracy um, operates fully for all people is a sign that democracy is strong in many ways in the United States and that it is something where we can continue to improve and continue to work. And I do think this is an opportunity for us to look at both how we can promote and support democracy overseas by also saying we have challenges at home and that we will stand with those who want to see those democratic values strengthened and expanded in their societies. And we do that with humility and with confidence that we do that in partnership with other democracy activists around the world. Can I say, Ryan, I just jump in yeah. real quick on this, which I think also an important point. I, I do think that, and I'll defer to my European colleagues or others who are listening, that I'm sure there's a lot of disappointment or concern about what's happening in the United States, both at the governmental level and what's happening in the past several weeks in terms of our society uh, and the racial issues. Um, but, you know, around the world, I'm sure they're, they're also thinking more about themselves and about us. They're doing this because people around the world want their own dignity, they want their own rights. Um, and they're, you know, I think American leadership matters a lot on this. The American model matters a lot, but people are focused on their own situations. And they're not waiting for America to have a perfect model of democracy in order to, to demand the rights and dignity that they think is theirs. And the fact is, even as Americans who recognize that our system is not perfect and never has been, we have this huge problem at the whole of our, of our founding, basically. Um, we still believe that a democratic world is more just, more stable, more secure for everybody equally. And that we just need to keep fighting for it everywhere and to the degree that we have problems at home, they're shown out in the open. And we're gonna deal with them openly, they're not hidden and we will partner with others around the world to try to make our, our system better just as we are helping others make their systems better for themselves. Uh, so I wanna make sure that we're, we're not just focused on ourselves here in the United States and just holding our head down but continuing the, the broader fight that is gonna be everlasting frankly. Kevin, I see you motioning. Would you like to jump in there? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, I mean, this is this is really very, very interesting and very and very uh, timely. It, one of the uh, one of the issues that is seldom remarked in the course of this discussions is that a, a big part of the story of the irresistible expansion of democracy globally over the past a half a century was connected, has been connected to the fact that the single most important international actor a, is a liberal democracy. And a, 
that has a, a, a twofold implication. If this leading actor um, gives up on liberal values and adopts a practices that run counter uh, to the liberal uh, underpinnings uh, of, of, their, of its political system, uh, democracy globally will suffer. And uh, I'm very concerned about the effect, quite frankly, that the past three years uh, may have had on the soft power of the US to promote democracy globally. I, I would like to think that this is not irrecoverable, but uh, it, it, it is a, a, a very visible effect. And the other thing that we have to uh, bear in mind is that, and again, I'm not saying that this will happen, but this may happen, that uh, once the dust settles a few years from now, after this crisis, uh, we might wake up in a world where the leading international actor is no longer a liberal democracy. And that will have implications. I mean, that will make the task of expanding the democratic creed all the much, you know, all the more uh, 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 hard for all of us that care about democracy. So uh, the geopolitical implications of this crisis will have a bearing on, on, on democracy and on the task that is uh, in our hands going forward. That gives me a chance to bring in an audience question as a follow-up to what you're saying there, Kevin. Uh, so the question comes from, Elsa Christensen uh, Red, Red, Redzipovic, I hope I got that right, from the European Commission. And it's a question about what your organizations are doing to utilize culture as a tool for defending and fostering democracy. And the reason I thought it's good to bring that in now is I think uh, it's probably fair to say that the soft power of official America has declined in the last three years for all the reasons we've discussed. At the same time, the ability of a civil rights movement in the US to spark action or much needed discussion in Europe, where Europeans often feel like they don't have a racism problem or a police brutality problem, for example, the power of American tech companies uh, to create platforms to facilitate democracy. And for all the problems on the Facebooks of the world, the Democracy Perception Index did show that essentially majorities in every country think that social platforms have a positive effect on democracy in their country. Um, Bringing all that together, you know, are there other aspects to soft power and American soft power um, that need to be considered alongside what the administration does? Anyone feel free to jump in. I maybe I'll start, but I'm, I'm happy to defer to my colleagues. But just to open it up, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, soft power, by definition, does not emanate from a government. Uh, soft power emanates from a society. I mean, this is partly why, frankly, uh, Kevin, I certainly share your concern about a world that's safe for Chinese autocracy, that the Chinese Communist Party does want to build a values neutral world in which nobody challenges their very repressive form of government. So, of course, that is something that keeps us all up at night. But fundamentally, China does not enjoy uh, a lot of soft power. I mean, you actually see a backlash to China when they try to promote uh, uh, some of their uh, sort of cultural and civilizational instruments. And the fact is that an autocratic regime is never going to be very good at this because it's directed by the state. Um, soft power flows from uh, society, from citizens, from free and open debate, from all of the innovation that you see uh, not controlled by the government. Uh, so in fact, I think as small d Democrats, uh, I think we're pretty confident uh, about uh, uh, sort of the soft power question. Um, it's not as if uh, Russia, Russian soft power offers some superior example or Chinese soft power uh, that everybody in the world is uh, striving for. Um, so that's one. Uh, you know, I think the other, the other point here um, is that... Uh, Fundamentally, uh, one thing you're going to see in the United States, you know, uh, democracies have a terrific ability to refresh themselves. Uh, democracy is not about the leader. Actually, the Chinese system, the Russian system is about the leader. Uh, democracy is about the people uh, and institutions. And so uh, I think things could look quite different here down the road in terms of the look at the United States. And again, 
I think the debate we're having in America about equal rights for all our citizens actually is really powerful. And if that debate were to happen in a country like China, uh, it would be quite revolutionary and quite dangerous for uh, the ruling system. Is there anyone else who wanted to respond to that? Otherwise I can come to Jersey with a question. Mm, go ahead, yeah. Uh, well, this... no, no, Jersey, I had, I had a different question for you, but please also feel free to respond. No, um, no, 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 I am happy to hear another question because also it's nice to hear many questions because all of them I believe are very relevant. Well, I wanted to pick up your point, one of your points about minorities that you made in your opening statement. And it really uh, struck me that often uh, Europeans don't see themselves as having uh, the problems convulsing America right now around its treatment of its minority communities. Um, because often those communities are, are simply invisible. People don't see the problem because they don't see the community, which is not something that you can say of, of, of the US. Um, and what really came out uh, for me was I noticed how invisible the situation of the Roma population in Europe um, has been in the last couple of weeks. Obviously, we were dealing with the treatment of black communities um, when this protest movement sparked. But I noticed that Roma communities, which are large in a lot of the countries that you deal with, are kind of written out of this picture of systemic racism. And I wondered if you had any reactions to that and, and how that affects the ability to, to build a cohesive society that, that can actually move forward together. Well, this is absolutely one of uh, those uh, signals that we are constantly receiving during the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic, <clears throat> that of course minority rights and vulnerable groups are affected most because of, for, for many, many reasons. And it, the range of, of uh, issues that, that we, we may even not see because there are obvious elements like Roma people uh, or racism, that uh, in, in, when we talk about that, that naturally comes to our mind as something that is uh, potentially under threat and we have proofs of it. And I can give you a few examples, but there are also elements of, of, of minority rights that we even uh, cannot think uh, um, uh, today. Uh, like for example, we are receiving signals from Lebanon where the huge uh, uh, group of people who are domestic uh, uh, workers were during pandemic simply overnight left over on the streets. Ethiopians and others living in, in, in Lebanon, uh, mostly illegally. Uh, and suddenly uh, th this is a group without any rights, any rights. So the, the, the state uh, has no uh, formula to, to address their needs. And we as international community, we don't even see it. But uh, when you are looking uh, into act activists on the ground who are looking for the human rights violations, who are observing situation and it is developing day by day, they are signaling to us uh, such issues. But coming to the more systemic issues that you absolutely rightly pointed, uh, the, the, the Roma people uh, in Europe and their rights are very, uh, very much and, and dangerous and, and we have noticed several of such a situation. Our partner uh, Romanet in Montenegro have absolutely uh, sent a lot of uh, warning signals uh, about uh, racism uh, against Roma, not only in Montenegro, but in the Balkan region and in, in, uh, in, in that part of, of, the, of the Europe. Uh, uh, same in, uh, in Armenia, we are receiving from our partner uh, Femhouse uh, that um, we will hear more today. They will tell their stories um, that increasing discrimination against LGBT community in, in Georgia, the offices of Tbilisi Pride were just attacked last week. And, and you know, uh, uh, these things happen also without pandemic, but the, during the pandemic, there is of course natural social phenomenon of increasing social frustration. People are locked down, people are staying in their homes, their uh, uh, feeling of frustration and aggression grows. And then they are actors who are trying to use this type of frustration and uh, and, and uh, simply uh, uh, drive them toward uh, certain minority groups uh, to say, here you can release your frustration. And this is extremely dangerous uh, uh, way of, of uh, uh, gathering popularity or gathering attention because you can, you can re re release demon or uh, 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 such a behavior from the bottle, uh, but uh, put it back together extremely, extremely difficult. So that is an extreme uh, threat that has to be tackled on a daily basis. And thanks to those civil society activists on the ground, it is 
tackled. And I think this is one of the most important part of, of not only our mission, but all democracy support community mission to, to make sure uh, they, they, they have resources to tackle those issues and to address uh, those uh, acts, absolutely unacceptable uh, uh, phenomenons that are happening. So here I do confirm uh, the, the vulnerable minority groups in every sense are suffering more than average in a society. Thank you. I've got another audience question now. It comes from Joella Hamati, and she's the president of the European Democracy Youth Network. Uh, the question is based around uh, political uh, systems and elites that were out of touch before COVID and how uh, the problems exposed by COVID uh, show even greater need to adapt. So the question for, for all or any of you is what are some things that young people can do to help political systems adapt, to help democracy adapt to the post-COVID world? Maybe Nicole, I'll bring I you in. <laughs> yeah, I would love to uh, jump in on that. On my day job, I'm a professor at Georgetown University, so I spend most of my day with folks who are in their 20s and 30s. Um, and there's such a tremendous activism among people um, of that generation um, to change the world, to, to make an impact. There's significant number of ways that they can do that. Obviously, getting involved in political parties and um, the, the structure of democracy in their country is a really important way and looking for what are the opportunities that they can put on the agenda of the political parties in their country, the issues which are passionate that, that young people are passionate about. Certainly there are any number of non-governmental organizations and advocacy organizations that young people can also um, get involved in. But likewise, we see just the tremendous impact that um, social movements have via social platforms, social media platforms that allow us to put issues on the agenda um, of our policymakers and of international organizations. And so whether it's through formal structures or whether it's through informal advocacy, there's a tremendously important role for young people to play in engaging institutions and engaging the society. I think it's also important that uh, young people become democracy activists for their generation. There's a lot of activism around climate change and around um, around individual issues, which um, are extraordinarily important. But what's important is also for many of these young people to realize that the ability to move those issues forward will depend on a democratic system that allows for that activism, that, that creates the space for that activism, but also allows for an open and transparent public policy process that allows for change. So as, you, as the young people are engaging in that activism, it's important that they become uh, little de-democracy activists as well as they as they move forward. Uh, have we got any other reactions? Maybe uh, Dan, if you wanted to react to that at all. Oh, Derek, sorry. <laughs> it's Derek's turn. Yeah. Oh. It is Derek's turn. <laughs> uh, first of all, um, Eden, and where Ms. Hamati is is the leader, is uh, one of our proudest um, uh, partners, both IRI and NDI, work with them. So it's wonderful to hear a question from from her. Um, like, look, I think young people, first of all, there is definitely a generational difference, generational um, uh, divide in the way uh, young people are looking at things, whether it's climate change or whether their involvement in democracy, they're being online, understanding the digital space. Uh, this is going to be absolutely critical to figure out how do we harness digital uh, technologies for democracy, rather than what we've seen so far is the bad guys using the digital space to, uh, to build, um, you know, uh, to, to create more disinformation, to create more confusion. Um, so I think uh, young people can help us think that through. I think they need to also take the activism that they put online, they have to figure out a way to channel it. This is one of the biggest challenges, is how do we channel that activism and put it into productive, constructive, and organized activity that contributes to governance, that contributes to actual change um, in a systemic way within a society. Because uh, we're seeing the activism of protest, we're seeing go out to the streets, we're seeing things online, but then that's that's just um, an activist activity. It's not a sustained effort that is channeled into governance, and we have to figure out ways with young people of how to do that. And then finally, um, we need to network. Um, young people in the United States, with people and young people in Europe and Africa and Asia, um, across different borders, talking together about their com commonality about their, their unique challenges. Um, I think that networking is gonna be very important for uh, building that sort of global community 
in an era where borders are less and less important and where some of these values are going to be very, very more and more important uh, as other actors seek to, to shape a different future for them. Maybe I'll pick up there and, and bring you in, Dan, because there's a question that links back in uh, to that thought process about how do you move from the activism to the governance. I think one thing we see a lot of with young people today is that uh, given the frustration they have with some democratic institutions, they often identify with brands now. They often seek to uh, put their, their money and their income behind uh, companies and organizations that align with their values. And the question from Rasmus Bertelsen is, what role do, do multinational companies play in the broader fight to defend democracy, glo democracy globally? Over to you, Dan. Well, maybe maybe I should start with a little bit a uh, different angle because the oh. it, it no it was I was asking uh, Dan to chip in. Ah, okay, okay, okay. You after that, Jesse. Don't, don't worry, don't worry. Later on. No, so, so it's a very interesting question. Um, I, you know, I'm interested in uh, my colleagues' views too. Uh, you know. There are several issues here. I mean, one is that uh, free markets require free people, that the open and productive economy that all of our countries enjoy is not uh, a politically neutral phenomenon. Uh, it is not coincidental that all of the richest countries in the world are open systems with rule of law, with secure property rights, with independent institutions. Right. Uh, this is not a trivial correlation. It's actually quite central. If we're interested in uh, everybody in the world being able to enjoy the fullest forms of human and economic development, they need political accountability. They need uh, equal justice, equal rule of law, all of the things that a democratic structure uh, aspires to. Uh, and the private sector is obviously central in a free and open economy to uh, producing uh, that degree of wealth that uh, underwrites uh, democratic order. That doesn't mean that only countries that are rich can be democratic, but it's to say that uh, uh, open markets and free societies are mutually reinforcing in quite powerful and important ways. And this is an important point, I think, in an era uh, when some of our young people uh, are quite attracted to socialist ideals. Of course, uh, they never saw them put into practice in sort of uh, the Soviet empire uh, or in countries like Venezuela, uh, where actually uh, when these things are actually put into practice, they destroy free economies and uh, free people. Um, so uh, there is that link. And then last thing I'll say for now, because there's, there's a lot of space to run on this question, Ryan, is the question of uh, a free and open internet. And what is the role of the private sector? Um, on the one hand, there are concerns in the United States, certainly in Europe, that uh, Facebook, uh, Alphabet, uh, Microsoft, that these are big dominant corporations uh, that need to be cut down to size. There is that view out there. Uh, there is also the fact uh, that uh, a lot of these technology platforms that have changed all of our way of life have been produced by these and other companies uh, and that they are game changers. And I think sort of hopefully uh, driving forces for uh, free and open speech, free and open debate. Uh, and that if we were say to uh, replace American tech dominance with uh, say Chinese tech dominance, uh, speech would suffer that free and open information environment, that digital analog of the free society in cyberspace uh, would be kneecapped. And so I do think there's a fundamental debate about the role of the private sector when it comes to the free and open internet. Um, uh, I'm not sure I'm uh, entirely pleased with where that debate is right now, uh, because in fact, these are just foundational issues for free societies that you cannot sustain liberal democracy in the real world if you cannot sustain the same open principles of transparency and speech uh, online. Thank you. Yeah, Kevin, I was, wanted to bring you in there as well. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if, you know, I, I don't need to be convinced of the value that free markets have for, for, for democracy. I mean, we have to acknowledge that, that correlation is not perfect. I mean, it, it, China has shown abundantly over the past generation that you can have uh, a, a reasonably free market without without democracy. The, the, the thing is that it, free markets come in different shapes. 
And here it is essential that we recognize that whatever, a, whatever a values, a, a, you know, whatever value free markets have for, for democracy, they're not good at distributing wealth. And the question of inequality has to be taken very seriously. And it's a question, by the way, that has, I mean, whose importance has been revealed in a very stark way by the current pandemic. And here I'm going to give you, you know, a, a, a factoid that I, I think is, is quite extraordinary. I mean, it, it comes from the, uh, from the United States. You know, over the past two months, over 40%, over 40 percent of the jobs paying less than $40,000 per year have disappeared in the US. At the same time, at the same time, US-based billionaires have added 434 billion to their fortunes, according- 565 to one now, 565 now, Kevin, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> what is that? 565 Five, billion now. Well, there you go, there you go. So, uh, you know, the, the virus is not man-made, but the patterns of its dissemination and its consequences most certainly are. So it, it is essential if we want free markets to underpin democracy, we have to take the question of inequality very seriously because it's wreaking havoc with societies and it's wreaking havoc with democracy. You know, and, and again, you know, since I'm giving factoids, I'll give you one that I find extraordinarily disturbing. And it comes from the region of the world where I come from. If you see the, uh, the latest regional poll done by Latino Arometro, which is one of the, of the big regional polls, when you ask people in Latin America whether they think that the political system works to further the common interest or alternatively whether it works to further the interest of the powerful few over 80 percent of people choose the latter i mean it is no wonder that they feel that they have no skin in the game they have no stake in the system it is very difficult to build a stable democracy if people don't feel invested in it. If people don't feel that the political system is taking their voices and their interests into account. So the question of inequality is essential for the future of democracy. And I would argue, and there has been a lot of discussion over the past few years, is probably essential also for the future of free markets. Mm -hmm. Jersey, can I bring you in? Uh, yeah, your experience thank you. Capital S socialism, but also <laughs> what I might call small S socialism, the high tax social democracies that are, are common around Europe. And sometimes the branding, I had to use that word for a political system, sometimes that gets confused. What's, what's your experience of differentiating those two things and, and how young people around the continent react to them? Well, l let me first come back to what I wanted to do at first uh, step uh, stage when I heard the question, because the question was originally not about uh, um, uh, about the kind of uh, big uh, meta discussion, um, uh, whether, um, whether uh, democracy and the capitalism can go hand in hand and whether development of economy uh, depends on democracy. This is a very important debate, but uh, I think the question was uh, more pragmatically uh, directed. It is, it is a question about uh, what, what is the role of multinational company in, in, in pursuing certain uh, or respecting certain values or at least uh, not, 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 not harming. And I think here uh, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can even narrow it down to certain specific uh, sphere of, of uh, free uh, uh, mindsets uh, that is simply access to information in independent media. If we look, for example, how this information is uh, uh, supported, uh, those uh, uh, machineries, if we take Russian case, for example, are partially financed by those multinational companies, not only by the, by the Russian budget and same in case of, of China. 
a lot of money comes from advertising industry toward those TV stations who at the same time disseminating a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, toxic uh, narratives. So, uh, and same, of course, if we, if we go back to discussion about the role in, in this, the, the dissemination information by big tech, uh, Facebook and others, uh, we can also add another layer of, of a discussion. So there is a lot of responsibility. <clears throat> so we can narrow down to very simple responsibilities. If, if we have a big multinational companies, they are placing their advertisement in, uh, in this and that uh, you know, government channel of authoritarian regimes, they have to spend equally at least 10% of same amount supporting independent media, as much as this or as little as this. And we, they are not doing so. So here, and same with, uh, with the big tech. I mean, you, you have uh, uh, some foundations set up by this or those big tech that are now trying to get involved in supporting independent media all, all over the world, but it is still not enough. So I think here is a very quick solution that we can apply and a quick uh, way of engaging big multinational companies in bigger responsibility for a free flow of information, for supporting uh, public interest media, for creating environment for civil society activists to grow and to perform whatever they would like to perform. And I think that this is the, the, the first uh, uh, element that I wanted to point attention in responding to this specific uh, question that was raised. But your question is of course my, my, of much, much uh, uh, bigger value. And I think, uh, honestly, I have, no, I have no answer to that. I, I rather struggle with this, uh, with this question because whenever I go to, to many of my activists, on the ground, uh, be it in North Africa or other places, I rather hear a, another question. Uh, how we can pursue democracy uh, and the values that you are now trying to uh, uh, help us in, in pursuing and what we could answer to the people uh, that are telling us, you know, uh, in 19th century when Europe was building its own wealth, you were not that democratic. So uh, today you are promoting democracy and democratic values, but you are already rich. Uh, and that is a not easy question. And when I talk to those most charismatic uh, young leaders on the ground, they are either Salafist or Marxist. And believe me, coming from the country and all my life fighting with Marxists, it's a, quite a challenge to talk to them and to, and, to, and to answer those difficult questions. I have some answers uh, in a practical sense that I, I can explain them. Explaining them that you know, uh, 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 those ideologies failed to deliver social order. And democracy is a bad system that has a lot of troubles, but there is no better one. Mm -hmm. We've got about five minutes left, so I might pick it up to run through the other four speakers now, Jersey, thank you. Um, and your media point lets me bring in one final audience question as we go through the, the panelists. And the question comes from Thomas Dodd, and he's uh, noting uh, the defunding of uh, Voice of America and other government funded media outlets. And his question isn't specifically about the defunding, but going through the Voice of America's, the BBC World Services and so on. Question is, are they dinosaurs now and no longer fit for purpose? Uh, should they be reformed or do they need to be deleted and something else go in its place? And, and I'd add the context point for anyone not familiar with the debate that when we see uh, Western media outlets withdraw from some regions like the Balkans. You certainly see RT and Sputnik uh, rush in, and there's certainly other powers that uh, use this uh, previously Western model um, to, to, to propagate their own perspective on the world. Uh, maybe we'll do it in reverse order. I'll start with you, Dan, and then uh, we'll end with you, Nicole. So I think we're all struggling with this in the free world, the fact that our great power autocratic competitors are running very sophisticated propaganda machines using things like CGTV in China, using things like RT and Sputnik in the Kremlin. Um, you know, free societies aren't gonna run global propaganda operations. And I think our interest collectively is in helping people behind various internet firewalls get access to free and objective information, get access to uh, free and objective investigative reporting on what's going on in their countries because people in countries like China, Russia, Iran live in an information vacuum, an information bubble. Uh, in which they cannot, uh, frankly, make their own choices without uh, full information, which their governments very actively censor. So uh, then the question, of course, Ryan, you'll have more to say about this than I will, about what is the correct funding model 
uh, for journalism in free and open societies. It's not going to look anything like CGTV or RT. Um, and this is something that we are all struggling with. I'd like to just take 10 seconds to come back to Kevin's very good point about inequality, because I completely agree that inequality is an extraordinary risk to both democratic practice and free markets. Um, I would like to say that I don't think the problem is with the free markets bit. I mean, I think in Latin America, as in many other countries, uh, you have seen various forms of predatory capitalism, of mercantilism, of various astute, acute political forms of corruption. Uh, certainly in countries like Cuba and Venezuela and uh, Nicaragua. And so I would just like us to distinguish between kind of the idea of a free and open economy that can deliver and is accessible to everyone and the fact that, uh, you know, political elites conduct state capture uh, to reap rents from uh, non-free economies. Uh, Derek, I'll bring you in. Um, well, just pick up on that point really quickly, if I can, before I get to the media point. Um, I think the term socialism, I think you mentioned this, Ryan, the term socialism is sort of bandied about in, in sort of uh, summary terms. And I don't think people are talking about going to becoming Venezuela or Cuba. I think what Kevin is talking about is exactly right. We talk about dignity when we talk about democracy. Democracy needs to deliver. And Madeleine Albright likes to say people need to vote and eat. So we talk about dignity, we talk particularly about political dignity, but people need economic dignity. They need to have a sense that the system works for them. They need a job as well as, as political rights. So if you don't give them that, if democracy doesn't deliver those basic needs, you're going to have people looking for an alternative. So it's absolutely essential when we talk about, quote, socialism, that it's not the socialism of Venezuela, Cuba, but more than somewhat more redistributive or some economic rights that give people some dignity. Um, on the uh, media point, uh, it's actually not defunding these organizations. They just kind of, the, the new person installed by Trump has wiped out the leadership of all these organizations, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, Voice of America, et cetera. Uh, but yes, they, they need to evolve with the times, um, but we need to have, you know, we got rid of the US Information Agency, which was a very important effort through the Cold War to get our information out there to shape understanding of the United States. The Chinese, as Dan says, are fighting this war. It's very important in the social media age uh, that we get out there and we're, we're thinking strategically and smartly and creatively about how to get our, you know, get facts out there uh, to get the truth into countries that are closed as well as simply demonstrate the value of a free media. Um, so uh, yeah, we need, need to evolve with the new tools and the new era that we're in, but we absolutely need these, these institutions to do this. And I just wanna say finally, since I have the floor, a year ago when I was in Copenhagen, I was uh, sitting side by side and actually did a podcast with Maria Reza. She was there. So I just want to give a shout out to her that um, just thinking of her, that she represents the best when it comes to courageous, independent media. And uh, Duterte is demonstrating uh, what it is to be, to take a democratic forum and destroy it and function. Um, and I think it's something we all need to keep an eye on. And I hope next year when we're all back in Copenhagen that she's there with us once again. Thank you, Derek, for that. Uh, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Ryan. I mean, I'll, I'll do pretty much what uh, Derek just did. I mean, I, I would like to say a word, uh, first of all, the, the question of inequality and, and, and markets. I mean, look, I'm, I'm sitting here uh, at one of the most open economies in the world, Sweden, which happens to have a very robust welfare state, right? It, it, you know, and welfare states make societies more resilient. You know, being unemployed in Sweden is not the same, quite frankly, as being unemployed in the US or Costa Rica, for that matter. Well, I happen to think that that's better for the working of the markets, and that's better for the workings of democracy. Because actually, one of the things that welfare states do is they lower the levels of social uncertainty. And that's crucial for the future of democracy. Um, about uh, the BBC and, and Voice of America and all that, I mean, I don't know enough about you know, media markets to be able to answer that question. I'm only going to say one thing, which is that uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, 
you know, we can have a discussion about, about that. But to me, the point is more basic. I mean, uh, one of the crucial parts of the struggle to protect democracy going forward is about protecting media full stop. Protecting free media full stop. I, mean, I don't care if it's the BBC or if, it, if it's a, a very small a, a, a outlet a, a online, but we have to protect the free media. We have to protect free media against censorship as we have to protect it against disinformation. And that's, I think, a twilight struggle that we have ahead of us for the foreseeable future and then some. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, Nicole, the final word goes to you. Excellent, thank you. Just a quick word. Um, I'll echo what's been said. Um, our competitors, other authoritarian governments are in the game on providing information in other societies and free countries, democratic countries have to be in the game. Um, and not in the game to be competitive, but to be in the game because everyone around the world needs free information, access to the truth and access to information in order for them to advocate for their rights to be able to um, advocate for a free society for each of them. So I, I don't know the details of whether it should be the same format as VOA or be adapted. We're obviously in a much different information environment, so we need to adapt to that. But it's unquestionable that this should be a strategic goal for, um, for the United States and certainly for other democratic countries. But I'll just say one final word. Our panel is about unity and united in democracy. And what we're seeing now is that underpinning every issue, whether it is um, the pandemic, whether it is racism, whether it's inequality, many of these issues, um, there is a massive difference between how democracies can and should be responding and how authoritarian governments are responding. And so when we look at this question of where do we have alliances, where do we have unity, where do we have joint action, there's no doubt that uh, that democratic thread has to be pulled throughout all of our alliances and throughout all of our collaboration, whether that's a governmental action or a non-governmental action, it is now so much, it's even more crucial now than it ever has been for us to unite around these values to ensure that we're responding in a way which is consistent with those values. Thank you so much, Nicole. That's a great note to end on. Uh, I wanna thank each of you for joining this discussion. I certainly found it illuminating. Uh, I won't individually thank all of you. you. I'll give you a collective thanks. Um, and I want to say that there are representatives from each of your organizations joining the next round of breakout sessions. So I'm going to do a quick reminder of that. And then everyone's got 10 minutes off uh, to make a coffee, uh, run to the toilet, whatever it is that you need to do. Um, and we'll be starting in 10 minutes time with those sessions. So breakout one is keeping democracy activism alive during COVID-19, getting you to share your stories. Uh, registered participants should use the link in the email that you received already. Breakout two, you can stay tuned right here. You don't need to change anything. The topic there is elections and disinformation, keeping on the democratic track. And breakout three, again, you'll need the link that was emailed to registered participants. And that topic is ensuring women's rights during a pandemic. Uh, so thank you so much. And if you're leaving us now, we're starting again at 1 p.m. Copenhagen time tomorrow with an absolute great lineup of national leaders and other panelists. So thank you so much, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.